Richie, how are you, brother? Yeah, I'm good, mate. How are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Anything about Everest, I'm all yeah. ears, and I've got big enough ears as it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> fascinating. So, Royal, well, there's lots of stuff. When you wrote your email to me, yeah, um, you've spent a lot of time in Thailand, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I was living there between work and climbing. So work in the Middle East, climbing the Himalaya on holiday and live in Thailand. Yeah. That was the way of things for 12 years. I loved, I've loved every single minute of being in Thailand, even when I got my nose broken by a Thai doorman. It was still Yeah, that's been, happens a lot, that sort of thing. It was still a great night. <laughs> <laughs> Little tip there for you, if you yeah, ever get... If you ever get mugged in a in a Thai nightclub, folks, by by the bar staff, which they will, they used to try and do. I don't know how it is in 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 the modern tourist world. There, rather than try and fight the bouncer, just go to the tourist police, and they'll get your money back for you. Yeah, right. Otherwise, you end up uh, with a nose I mean, this shape. Yeah, you don't fight one; you fight ten as well. Yes. Savage, isn't it? The the Asian face is something we don't really understand in this country. Well, as uh, my friend said to me once, just because the lion shows his teeth, don't think he's smiling. Oh, yeah, exactly. And I quite like that one. Yeah. Yes. The Thai smile means many things, but not necessarily happiness. Yes, it can hide a grievance that will last a lifetime, can't it? Yeah, no, it's a funny place. The whirlwind, you know. But Thailand it's also fun. It's also funny because one of the um, lovable aspects of Thai culture is they're very accepting, aren't they? Yeah, you know, they. It's such a. It's a lovely country, but you scratch that surface, and it's very different underneath. You know, it's. I think if you go there on holiday, you'd come back loving it. But you live there for a little while and you start and as long as you've not got complete shit in your eyes, you know, you can you can kind of see that underbelly come through relatively quickly. Hong Kong's like that. I've met so many or spoken to so many expats that have read my my memoir, Eating Smoke. Right. And they're like Yeah, right, yeah. They say, I did I never saw a triad when I was in Hong Kong. I'm like, you walk through one chai, that's that's a triad there, that's a triad there, that guy on that standing on the club door, that's a you know, this is it, it's funny how you can get under the skin of something and it's a completely different um experience. Yeah. yeah so definitely. What, no, it's a funny, funny, funny. Yeah, sorry, go on. No, no, no. What what made you join the Royal Signals? Um, you know, I was, I was in the TA before in the Royal Anglians and I really did want to join the infantry, but I'd just done four years at college doing an engineering BTEC. And, um, I just thought, I didn't, I didn't do all that. And I worked quite hard to pass it as well. And, you know, used the technical background, obviously with a view to getting out of the army with a trade as well. I mean, that was the main thing, but you know what, I ended up on the circuit on the team carrying guns. So maybe I should have joined the infantry in the first place. <laughs> right and can you clear something up for us the two corporals that were yeah. executed in belfast um gosh yep. i'm gonna have to keep apologizing i forget their names do you do you, do you remember their names it, it was no i don't know their names i know what you're talking about yeah so and, and anyway somebody will put it put it in the comments but 
that was that happened the summer that I served in Belfast. So we were literally about to to deploy. Um, yeah. And for our friends listening that don't know what we're talking about, two, it, it was a let. It was alleged that these two gentlemen were signalers, right? So squaddies, but they, they were royal signals or, or some such thing. And that they'd driven into an IRA yeah. funer funeral accidentally when they were undercover. So the new guy was, sh the, the, the guy that was about to leave Belfast was showing the new guy around. And lo and behold, right, they yeah. drove into an IRA funeral cortege. The, the, um, the mourners at the funeral quickly realized these guys ain't with us. So they surrounded the car and cut long story short, they, they, um, they dragged these uh, two unfortunate men out and, and, and executed them. And it was, it was all, it was all filmed by a, by a, an army or a police helicopter. It was absolutely awful. Um, the name Howes is coming into my head, Corporal Howes, but I, again, I might I might be wrong there. Yeah. But what I, I mean, wanted to ask you, thing, because it happened. Um, yeah, sorry. No, I just wanted, what I wanted to ask you, Richie, was they always said they were six, but then people are telling me, no, they were 14 in, so they were intelligence. No, what, what it was, we had, we had a unit called Jakuni, Joint Communications Unit, Northern Ireland. And it, it was just a posting. I mean, it was, um, you did wear civilian clothes, um, but it wasn't, I mean, there, there were some ops over there, like Ajax and Hawker and things like that. You know these? I'm not they, familiar I, with those. I believe names. that they weren't 14 in. So they were, they were Jakuni, as far as I know, signalers, just doing their handover. And, and I, I'm not sure, but maybe there might have been an element of big timing a bit on the part of the guy going out on his bravery at where he went. Maybe, you know what I mean? He shouldn't have pushed his luck that much. And maybe, then, you know, I hate to say this sort of thing, there could have been an element of big timing when he was doing, doing his um, driving the guy around, you know? Or, yeah. You know, maybe it wasn't, it was just pure bad luck. You know, who just knows? I just Googled their names. You'll have to excuse excuse me, but uh, it's only polite. Derek Wood and David House uh, killed on the 19th of That's March. Right, so right. literally three months before we deployed. And yeah, there's that thing, yeah. isn't there? You you've done the security job in the Middle East. And yeah, it's so easy to get lackadaisical and fall into routine. And get cocky. Yeah, very, very much so. Yeah, very much so. Like, you know, like we was in Basra and sometimes you go to Talil, which was on MSR Tampals, like two hours away. Or if you went across the desert, it was three and a half hours. Obviously, across the desert is completely safe because there's no IEDs in the desert. Mm. But on Tampa, that's where they all are. And you might get, right, I'll be back in two hours or I'll be back in three and a half. And you'll be like, sod it, let's just push and get back. You know, so you get things like that happen. But I mean, complacency does set in a little bit when you're doing something for so long. Yeah. I mean, the other thing as well, I remember in Belfast, it was really exciting to go out. And the, the second company that I served with over there, because I started with one company and then we got attached to another company, my, my team. And the beauty of that was this, this uh, company, so it's Lima Company 4-2 Commando for our people listening, is they only did very short yeah. patrols, whereas M Company, who I was with, did really long, all-day patrols, 12 hours. They were utterly exhausting in, in one of the hottest summers I think we'd had for years. And with Lima Company... You literally just sort of like ran out the gate and you're out for two hours, two and a half hours, maybe four at the most. So it was a nice short thing to be on. You got to use all yeah, your yeah. sort of all your skills of so stopping the players, searching, um, doing your, your five meter checks to check there's no IED wherever you stop, all this sort of stuff. But um, 
towards the end of the tour, it's almost like you want to go out and patrol more because it was it was fun. You know, it 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 was fun, and yeah, I guess I, I know what you mean. Yeah, and I guess in that in that with that fun element, it's easy to overlook the severity of the actual situation you're really in. Yeah, it really is, and you, I mean, bad, the main thing we had in Basra was the IDF. The IDF was really, really heavy at points. Um, because it's sheer down there, we didn't really have to worry about suicide bombers, because, you know, martyrdom's more a Sunni thing. So, on, I mean, the army, they were getting hammered, you know, they really were. The, when the Brits were there, oh, they were having a bad time, they really were. But for private security, we was relatively getting away with it, compared to, like, places like Fallujah or Baghdad or Mosul, certainly the convoys as well. You know, those convoy guys, they just used to get hit all day long. But we were relatively okay in Basra. And because my team was like a, a recce stroke liaison team as well. So we didn't actually carry clients. So we could do things slightly different as well. Mm. My friend Brad was uh, exec executed, shot dead in Mosul. Um. I don't yeah, know. We, yeah, we, we. I don't know if it was your time. He is with a group called Olive Security. I know Olive. I worked for. I did a. I worked for Olive for a couple of months in 2015, actually. Yeah, he. Um, yeah, that was a bit. That was a bit of a shocker, but it's the nature of the job, isn't it? Really, that's that's why the 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 money was so good. Yeah, you didn't know. The, the thing is, we had some people taken, and um, at one point, you didn't know. There was lots of people wearing police uniforms, but I was talking to a guy who was a, a policeman with G4S, and they were doing the police training out there. And uh, no, I think it might have been Armour Group they were at that point, but they were doing the police training, and I think they were told they're not putting enough people out. And they, got, and they said, what do you want, quality or quantity? And they were told quantity. So they open the doors and then you just let in a, a ton of militia just got into the police. So, you know, you'd go along, you'd see a police checkpoint there, but you didn't know if they were police or not. Mm. You know, and, and a lot of the time, like for some people, by the time things got to a point where they knew something were wrong, they were very up close and personal with each other. You know, you, you're about five, min five meters away from a truck with a PKM on it or something like that. You know, it's like, I think that's the problem. What's, what's the PKM? You know, like the, the belt-fed uh, Soviet Soviet weapon. Is I guess like, like, like our GPMP. All ah, right. Not quite 50 cal then, but... No, no, 762, I think. Yeah. yeah. But, what, you know, like... What weapons did you use over there? Uh, we had M4 uh, Glocks and we had Minimis as well. So, I mean, we was a, an American contract, you know, it was a DO, Department of Defense contract. It was cost plus, you know, so we had really, really good kit. I mean, it, it was the reconstruction contract. Mm. So, uh, you know, we, we had that, that contract had a lot of money on it and we got a lot of good kit, but we didn't have ECM. And when we used to tell the army that we didn't have ECM, they used to say, well, they'd be scared to go out without it. But... I don't know, I think you just get used to it, you know? I mean, I remember when, when I was on Telic, on the original invasion of Iraq with the army, we had soft skin Land Rovers, and uh, I just had two sandbags in the footwell that was supposed to be mine protection. I mean, I'm not sure how much use two sandbags are, but hey, you put them in there, because it's got to be better than nothing, but... Uh, so ECM... You, know, you get used to, you know? Electronic countermeasures, Again, yeah. for the for the for the uninitiated, it's just an electronic pack you carry that it sends out a signal that interrupts the signal that the bomber is sending when he's detonating his device by a mobile phone or a radio control um, pack or something like this. We carried ECM in Northern Ireland. Is it is it effective? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, obviously, it won't stop command wire. But I think if it's got a wider, wider range of frequencies, it should, I mean, it should work. 
you know, it's operating on that, say a mobile phone, a mobile phone signal operates in a certain spectrum. And if you can block that spectrum, you can block all mobile phones, you know. We had a, this is, was an embarrassing moment for the chat. We had an SBS captain sat in our, in our unit briefing. So it was the whole of 4-2 Commando being briefed by the CO before we, before we went over to Belfast. And one speaker, I think they had a speaker up to talk all about ECM equipment, right? So, so a guy from a regiment that had just returned, something like this. And, and he did this whole lecture on ECM equipment. And then right at the end of it, he said, any questions? And this SBS captain put his hand up and said, yes, in the recent command wire incident with private so-and-so, why didn't the ECM protect him? Oh, bless him. And the whole room just <laughs> went, the whole room went, oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so well, again, everyone has their moments like that. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of a moment. So what, yeah. uh, you must have seen some, incidents over there can we call them incidents um as, to be honest i got away with quite a lot i mean the one contact my team was in my team was in two contacts one happened when i was on leave and the second one happened about two weeks after i'd actually left the contract so as my, myself actually we didn't actually we, we were very lucky you know, but a lot of that come with the risk mitigating as well. So, uh, I mean, main thing was just, I mean, the IDF, I mean, I didn't really come face to face with some contact that finished with a big trauma situation. Can you just you know, explain so I very, I I IDF? So we'd talk, so I'm... Uh, in Indirect fire. Mm. So, the, so the, the militia or whoever would set up their mortars put a timer on it and then leave it and then whatever time it would go off. But one thing that was never reported, a lot of the people that put the mortars down and put the IEDs down, they weren't actually militia. You know, I don't know why this has never come out, but you've just basically got normal people and they're trying to earn a few quid. You know, I think an IED at the time, so like in 2006, this would have been, it was like uh, $200 for an IED there was a thing called EFP, which was explosive form projectile. Now that was an IED that had a copper plate on top of it. And this was a bit of a step up because when that blast, it would turn the copper plate molten. Mm. And then that would just go through anything like a knife through, through butter. So that was worth a thousand if you could get one of these EFPs. If you could get a hit on someone, you'd get paid money. If you got a hit and killed someone, you got paid money. If you got a hit, killed someone and filmed it, I think the militia were paying you like $2,000 or something. So potentially an Iraqi could get an IED for 200 and potentially make two grand off of it. Or if he had a bit more money in EFP, and then you could guarantee the success and the money that comes with it. So there was a lot of the same. I'm not sure what the pricing was for the mortar team, but it's just like everything. You've got some hard up young whatever in the area i don't think it's too hard to get young disillusioned people who are poor extremely poor to do stupid things to make some money quickly you know mm. like i mean let's face it i dare say there's a lot of people in our army that don't really care about the politics of it they just want to be in the army well i don't i don't think they understand the politics of it if that that that's how the army's able to recruit isn't it is if you if you had to be 40 by the time you joined up, people would be like, fuck that shit. I ain't working for George Bush. <laughs> I ain't gonna make Tony, I'm gonna make Tony Blair and you know his next billion. Um yes. Yeah, but you know, we've we've been making rich people money with war since the Crusades and before. So <laughs> that's you know, it. I think that you know that that's I mean, that was the thing with, with going to Iraq in 2003. I mean, let's face it, we all thought there was weapons of mass destruction. I mean, we was 
uh, given the nerve agent tablets and the bacterial agent tablets, we got offered if we wanted anthrax jabs, which I quite politely declined, you know, but we didn't have to have them. Some units, they made their guys have all these jabs. But when we went out there, we thought the, the threat was real. You know, we were going there to live. Right? Obviously, oil was, we always know that's the bottom line. But then when you go out there and it's like, yeah, and you hear that the G2, the intelligence brief was sexed up a bit. It's like, yeah, we went there just for oil. But I'm not being, every war ever fought has been over territory and money. You know, what the bloke on the ground thought and what the powers that be actually know have always been two different things. So but it's really, there's nothing new there. It's very brave that you say this, Richie, because it's what young people need to hear. Um, but I'm always, <laughs> I'm always saying is this. Um, yes, it, 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 the dichotomy, if that's the right word, or the challenge that young people, young people face now is that for example the Royal Marines is just it's quite a good job to do for a few years you know at least to yeah. get the berry and then do one tour or, or go on a jolly to the Caribbean I mean it, it's like nothing you could ever explain to your civilian counterpart yeah um yeah. But of course, you're doing the job that you just described. You're making the sociopaths even richer than they already are on their next phony, you know, phony invasion. But of course, the alternative is to stay in Civvy Street. And and you can see why I get a lot of young people write to me, go, Chris, I know it's a whole load of horseshit, but I've just set my heart on joining up and what what can you say you know what can you say because I mean, i've worked in offices the directors are complete cock all the managers are shallow cowardly cocks none of them could organize a picnic if you paid them a million pounds in fact you wouldn't want to go on a picnic with these the the, the it, it, this culture develops a certain type of people that get to the top and they're not, in my opinion, and I can obviously only talk about the situations I've been in, not, not every single company, yeah. but I, I would just call them a bit useless with very limited life experience. And this is the, this is the, the challenge you, you, you face if you want to join the forces, isn't it? You know, you've got on the one hand, you're, defect, you're fighting for evil, on the other hand, to stay in Civvy Street, you're working with idiots. Um, not all, not everyone's idiots, but people, you know, hopefully they get what get what I'm trying to say. You know, at the end of a year in a civilian job, you know, what 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 have you achieved? You might have been to Ibiza for two weeks, and got pissed every Friday, Saturday, hangover Sunday. Maybe you like mountain biking or something. It's yeah, yeah. Just chucking yeah. it out there to be on, to be honest, folks. Make of it what you will. It's 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 a conundrum. Now, even if you're working, you know, even in Civvy Street, though, you're still making money for conglomerates. So one way or another, you know, someone's making money. I mean, even if you're not in the army and you're be, and you're a bank manager, you're still making money for the bank and everyone involved in that. So you're all, you know, no matter what you do, unless you're going to be, I don't know small level entrepreneur or something managing your own money i mean you're always making money for that that bigger player yeah so i'll be honest i'm completely comfortable with it chris you know i've i've done a lot of study into history i've got a i like to think i've got a pretty good understanding of world history and you know control and all that it's nothing new i mean we've always been controlled in one way or another i mean even in a family unit you control your older sibling has more power than you you know Parents have more control than the kids. That's a control system. You know, it's everything's a control system. There's nothing, you can see them all. You know, there's nothing hidden in it. If you, if you open your eyes and look, right, people say they're controlling us. Of course they are. It's always been that way. There is yeah. no other way it could be because that's what we do as animals. Like, it's just how we are. Mm. And as I say, I've got, I don't worry about it. You know, when it comes to the army and the rights and wrongs of joining it, well, every, everyone's got, uh, 
blood on their hands, but you know, the British Empire of every empire to ever exist, we're the only one that give up our territory at the end of a quill rather than a bloody bayonet. Because every other empire fell through a war or they got beaten. Napoleon, it, at the end of Napoleon, it was that finished his empire. The Ottomans, they lost theirs at the end of the First World War because they picked the wrong side. Ours, after the Second World War and stopping someone else having an empire, maybe we couldn't quite conscientiously keep people to fight for someone. We just stopped doing the same thing. You know, so empires have their place and maybe at the moment they're just out of date now, you know? Yes. Yes, it's fascinating. History is fascinating. The, I don't really want to get get into this, but the more you learn about yeah. it, the more you realise that there's two histories. <laughs> there's the one that you're taught, and then there's there's probably what what really happened. Um, yeah, mind you, I mean every, everyone's got bias. I mean, they say history is written by the victor. If it was written by the loser, I don't think it would be any less bias. No, you know. So it's, it is what it is. And I, I try and sort of watch multiple sources on the same thing. And then, you know, if there's five facts that go across, you can probably say they're true. And then everything else is just speculation based on what that historian thinks. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, and you don't understand the world today if you don't know your history, I think. No. It becomes interesting when you, like the other day I was talking about Pearl Harbor. And if you take the official yeah. narrative that there's the, you know, let's talk in literary terms, the poor Americans there with their fleet in the Pacific, out of the blue, get attacked by this savage mm. enemy with their war cry, Banzai, and, you know, and, it, 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 and, and then the good old Uncle Sam came in to help poor little England and, and, and da da da. You know that all just sounds like a great bloody story, doesn't it? And but then when you hear that actually no, they charged us money to come into that war, and that we only we only paid that debt off. It was like in the last it's ten years. Or, yeah, it was in the it's in the last twenty years we've been paying that debt to the Americans, and then you then you learn of the um, trade disagreements between America and Japan. And the sanctions that were being put in place and, and, and all this kind of thing. And then someone comes out and says, oh, actually, they heard the radio uh, communications of the, the Japanese bombers as they came in. So they could have, you know, they could have alerted the fleet, but they chose not to. And I, I'm not saying what which of this is true and what's not. I'm just saying that there's always two two stories, aren't there? Yeah, there is. And I think that's it. I mean, it that was it. I think Japan had been bankrupted. They had embargoes on them. They needed to invade China to get rubber and tin and stuff like that. But they knew the moment they did that, America would swoop in. So they had to remove, from my understanding anyway, mm. so they had to remove that fleet so they could get onto China and start. I think that's it. They were an animal in a corner that was desperate. And a cornered animal will always do desperate things. So, you know, when you've got embargoes on you and you're, you're going under rapidly and you need to go somewhere and get resources what are you going to do like you know yeah they were kind of forced anyway. into a corner yeah um richie yeah, were, yeah. before we talk about your monumental achievement in climbing mount everest can we just talk a bit about thailand because um you mentioned yeah. you know there's a a few things happen, lots of things happen in Thailand. A lot of Westerners die or end up in, in prison over there. Um, yeah, right, yeah. So David McMillan, who I spoke to the other day, he, um, friends, if you're watching, watch the Dave McMillan podcast. He was sentenced to death in Thailand and he cut, through, right, right. He cut through the bars of his cell and escaped, right? Um, which, you know, as you, as you would, but yeah. we, we also, we had a, a couple of Marines that were surfing on top of a train in Thailand and it went under a tunnel and they, um, they lost their lives. My friend's father was on a float in one of these festivals that, that the Thais have and he fell off, yeah. banged his head and, and he died. That was, that was last year. And 
yeah, you get this situation where there's an awful lot of stuff happens in Thailand and a lot of it's quite, quite serious. Um, you also, Richie, you get a certain type of expat. Do, do, do you get what I'm saying? You, you get, spe- I'm talking about the, the blokes here in particular, but you get these kind of wanderers that have done, you know, you just get a certain type of, of person. Is this making sense or, or do I need to <laughs> try and explain? No, a bit no, I know what you mean. What is it? Uh, Spies, Lies and Mercenaries or something like that. You know, I think there's a book of all the different sorts of weird and wonderful. Some are telling the truth, some are full of shit and... Yes. Everything in between. And then you get your football shirts, as I think of them. They're your England shirts that probably yeah. never been abroad much in their life, but they go to Thailand. Love it. There's all these beautiful women that, that you know, appear to love them. And they make a home for themselves mm. there. And it becomes like their little England, but in Thailand, or it, you can say the same for Hong Kong. Um and they get fiercely yeah. protective of their, you know, their narrative. Um, I mean, I've had people ask me, "What? why did you write a book about Hong Kong? You only lived there a year. And I say, well, that's the year that I wrote about, <laughs> right? But they genuinely get really, yeah. really upset that I've lived here 20 years. I haven't written a book. <laughs> Not my fucking problem. <laughs> um, yeah interesting mix of people isn't it yeah it, it's um, i lived in a few places so I, I was on kotel for quite a while uh bouncing between work and that and kotel very much a backpacker scene there very yeah. much sort of yeah just all the backpackers and it, that's very different to the mainland you know like kotel is kind of its own thing as i say everyone goes there to die and it's all backpackers or trap packers, as we call them, because God, they're annoying, you know. And then I was in Patia for a couple of years. And obviously, Pats is where the main sort of core of all that sort of stuff is. And, uh, and then my last few years, I was living in Phuket, in southern Phuket. And that was a different scene as well, because there was actually like expat girls over there. like all, And I sort of moved to Phuket to get away from the, the patio scene a bit, like all my friends were ex-military and from the job and all that. And it was nice to go to Phuket and get away from that, you know, because it was just mental in, in Phuket. It's just, everyone's hard on it. I mean, I used to do eight weeks, no, 12 weeks at work. For four weeks, I was just in the bottom of a bottle. Then you go back to work because it's dry as well. So you're just hammering it on leave. Then you go to work, you dry off. And then there's people, I think if not for the job, giving them that time to dry out from whatever they're doing, then more people will be dead. Because I think the problem is a lot of people are discovering drugs, like they get on the circuit, they get to Asia, and when they discover drugs for the first time, they can afford it as well. Mm. Rather than being like a young person who gets into drugs, you can't really afford it. And maybe that in itself stops the addiction. But when you're getting paid a lot of money and you find it and you think, oh, this is what everyone's on about and you can afford it, you know, and that that leads to a, a bad place for a lot of blokes. Like, you know, it really does. And yeah, we've had you, a few You've got to be so careful buying and taking your drugs in Thailand as well, because, it, well, there is a death sentence there for a reason. At the very minimum, all the police are fairly corrupt and if they even sniff that you might have just bought something they're on you if not to go take you to the cash point and empty your empty your bank account if you can't give them that money then you're in a Thai prison awaiting awaiting a a, a, what can be a lengthy sentence and some of the bars or the motorbike taxi guys are opposite and they know what goes on in certain bars and as soon as you leave they're on the phone and I mean, I know one guy and he was seeing this girl. This wasn't the police, but he was seeing this girl. Anyway, he broke up with her. Um, as he was flying back to work, he was in a hotel in Dubai going through his bag. She'd put a bag of ice in his bag. Mm. 
you know, that was like revenge, trying to get him. So he's gone through Bangkok Airport with that, Dubai Airport with that. Luckily, it hadn't been found. But it's like, that's revenge, isn't it? You know, you get me banged up carrying ice because I finished my relationship with you. It's um, <laughs> it's absolutely crazy over there, you know? It's just... And I told her, another, someone about that, and she was like, well, maybe she loved her too much, loved him too much. And I'm like, really? You get him in jail for 20 years because she loved him too much. It's crazy. Yeah, I've been at the full moon party on Koh Pan Yang. Oh, and yeah. we stayed on... Um, Oh, what's the other island that's near near Koh Phangan? Um, Koh Samui. Koh Samui, yeah. Koh Samui. So I was staying on Koh Samui at the time, and the night of the full moon party, before all the speedboats come to pick you up, which is just a bloody exciting thing again, especially especially if it's a choppy sea. It was quite that was quite an experience. But the manager of our backpacker. He was a Swiss guy, spoke Thai fluently because he'd been there so long. Um, he went round the ta every table in the restaurant that evening saying, full moon party? Yeah. He said, right. Take your drugs here before you go. Do, do not take anything with you to Koh Phan Yang, right? And then when you're at the full moon party, you see why the undercover Thai police have got Westerners on the beach and that you can see them, they're stripping the Westerners down, going through all their pockets, looking for anything, yeah. even a little bit of smoke, just just to be able to arrest them and then take them to the cash point or... Um, yeah. Your holiday can turn pretty I heard, the guys, I heard the guys with the, um, you know, they have the skipping rope that's on fire. Mm. I heard, I heard that those guys have a bit of a deal with the local health centre, that they dump they dump it on every X amount of people. They get burned, have to pay them, and they get a kickback from it. I don't know if that's true, but it wouldn't surprise me. You know, it's one of those things. It's That's amazing, because I'm reading, right as we speak, I'm reading Colin O'Brady's book. He was the guy that was the first to ski across Antarctica. Okay. Um, the same time as my friend Captain Lou Lou Rudd SAS, they both they both did it at the same time, and right. Colin O'Brady had the burnt skipping rope thing in Thailand. Oh really? It? Yeah, <laughs> but it 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 put him in a wheelchair for x amount of months, if not years. He couldn't walk. Yeah. He was that bad badly burned up by it. Right. Um, went on to. Ski across Antarctica. So there's a lesson for all of us. Live, yeah, live your right. dreams. Have yeah, you, no. Richie, have you heard of Misty's Bar in Patea? Misty's. No, that, maybe, you know, a dozen dozen ring a bell, I'll be honest. Okay. That's a very old friend of mine that owns that one. Oh, okay. Yes. And have you come across a lot of Westerners getting killed over in Thailand or, or you know? St yeah, um, we've had a suicide, um, overdose, and one of our friends just died uh, just accidentally. Don't know what was going on, if there's PTSD involved or I, I don't know. I mean, but as I say, it's one of the guys that hung himself. I mean, is this the old story? Why didn't anyone, why didn't he say anything to anyone? You know, I mean, I'm not being funny. For, for the craziness that Thailand is, there's a lot of us over there and there's a huge support system over there, you know, and it's really sad that someone was clearly, even though all the blokes were there and all your lifelong friends, so a lot of core guys, they, they was all together. I mean, for me, there was no, no X6 guys over there, you know, so I didn't have a history just from the job. But, he was there, he's got history with these guys, he was in the core with them, he's working with them, but still he was alone enough that that wasn't enough. Mm. You know, and I, I think maybe ICE is involved as well at some point. And um, we, we had another guy, and I don't know, apparently he was getting really paranoid about things, like, I don't know, just like really mad paranoid, and he's like gone out of a window, and you know, a lot of those roofs, they're like that thin, you know, just 
it looks it looks solid, but it's not. And as he's come out of the window, he's just fell about I don't know, like ten meters onto a concrete floor. And obviously, Thailand being Thailand, they've got pictures of him on the bloody TV in the newspaper and that because they don't they don't shy away from the graphic the graphic photo, do they over there? And um, in Hong Kong, they used to put the pictures of the shark attacks on the front page of the blooming papers. So some poor guy getting dragged out to sea with no legs. That's what you saw on the front of the paper. Yeah. There's like no holes barred there. They really, mm. yeah. No, it's, as I say, it's like that. I mean, with the deaths and that over there, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just that whirlwind. They say, you know, it, it draws you in and spits you out broken. Mm. Just one question before we move on to the mountains. Um, and for anybody listening and, and for our wonderful U YouTube, we are not promoting the use of substances here whatsoever. Yeah. Um, this is purely educational. Yeah. But a lot of people get confused about what ice is when, when I sp speak to them. And, and I explain what it, what it was in Hong Kong, right? Right very quickly so you get your your party speed which you buy in a club in the uk and it's basically sherbet it's it's glucose 95 percent glucose and five percent amphetamine sulfate and it gives you a bit of a high for five or six hours maybe maybe a bit longer then you get methamphetamine which is commonly referred to in the uk as base it's a slightly different chemical composition i believe i i don't know um, but it's, it's like about 30 times stronger than, than the party stuff, right? Is that the same as Yabba, what they call Yabba in yeah. Thailand? Yeah, Yab Yabba, right. the little red pill that you get in Asia, so it's made, it made predominantly in Burma, but you can buy it in Cambodia. Um, you don't get it in Hong Kong, but I'll explain why, because you get ice in Hong Kong. Um, and it's a little pill. I'm not going to say how you take take it uh, because I don't want to sound like I'm I'm promoting it. But that's methamphetamine, right? So that's a very strong form of amphetamine. Ice is methamphetamine purified to crystal form. So it is literally just the base amphetamine, methamphetamine with no adulterants, no, it's not cut. And the reason it's called ice is it looks like rock salt. It's these little crystals. And it, it, you know, one of those crystals will keep, will, it's enough to keep you up for 48 hours, right? And in, a, in a, say, let's say you spent $10 or 10 quid, 10 euros, there's an, you know, there's an, like I say, there's an, there's probably about ten crystals in it, so it's really, really strong stuff. You don't crash on it like you do with other stuff because you can just keep taking it and ding, you stay. Even after seven, eight, nine days, you stay at that level of awareness and focus. The trouble is, the mental health issue comes in. Then your brain just starts to get overloaded with tiredness. And chemicals and that's when you start to see people climbing up lamp posts and you know doing what i did which was try to crawl across a, a cable between two skyscrapers right yeah. what i wanted to ask rich is the ice you saw in thailand was it this crystal stuff i did you know what i've never actually seen it i knew that guys were using it and that but i'll be honest when i watched the podcast with you i think yesterday and when how you just explained it, that's the first time. I didn't know how the difference between meth, ice, I didn't actually know what the difference was between, before yesterday. I just knew that ice was really bad and some of my friends were in a bad place and died from it. And meth, you know what I mean? So yeah. I didn't actually see it with my own eyes, I'll be honest with you. Another thing, again, I'll just say this for, from a point of safety for our travellers that are listening. In Asia, if you ask for the white stuff, which can be few and far between the locals will bring you heroin, right? 
and this you, sort of you this have sort got to you got to be aware of it because two yeah, lads my friends, um, he went he really good guy really he was a legend uh, and he went to he was doing a course and he went to Lao just to do like a visa run and uh, and this guy was an absolute legend he was he was loved absolutely loved and the next morning, he's done his visa run. They've knocked on the door. Him and the guy in his room were both dead. Yeah. And, and we think it was that. They think it was coke, but it wasn't. It was. And the thing is, this guy, he was, you know, not mad on it. He was, you know, had his stuff together more than a lot of blokes. It was just that really, really bad yeah. luck, you know. They give you pure China white, which costs nothing in Asia, right? Pure heroin. And of course, you think it's 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 Charlie. You do a big fat line, and bang, your your body just stops work. You stop breathing. You, you go unconscious. Your respiratory system ceases to function, and you die die un, in your sleep, basically, or die unconscious. Um, again, folks, if you're listening, lived a good life. You don't need any of that shit. The answers yeah. are all the answers are all all in here. Talking of the white stuff. Let's go to the mountains. Yeah. The good white stuff, the snow. Yeah. What's, um, so, how the hell did you in, embark on that career? Yeah, so that's, as a, I was saying before, I was, when I went, I went to Kilimanjaro, flew up that, and I thought, you know, Everest is only three k's more, thinking about it, and then you realise it's actually, my TL at the time, he was an ex-para reg lad, but he was also X23. So he'd achieved some things in his life. And I said to him, I said, I know it sounds really stupid, but I'm thinking about Everest. And he went, if you're gonna dream, dream big. And then another guy, I was in the gym, and as I walked out the gym, this bloke sparked a cigarette up. And I went, You take your cigarettes to the gym. And he went, if you're gonna be a bear, be a grizzly. And these two phrases really stuck with me. And then I, I just started researching it, finding out what I needed to do. You know, and I started off, I did a two-week mountaineering course in Chamonix, followed by Mont Blanc. Uh, then I went to Denali, which is uh, just below 7,000 metres in Alaska. And that lot was like an expedition, and you've got a big pack, and you've got to pull sledges and all stuff like that. And then I went to Choyu in Tibet, which is an 8,000er, to get experience with using oxygen. And then uh, as part of my beat up training for the fitness, I went to Aconcagua. So 7,000 meters of trekking peak, but that was more for the fitness build up. So when I went to Everest, I was ready. You know, I could be quite self-sufficient as much as I could be. I was strong and I was fit because I had to actually go up twice. I, I got two hours from the summit and turned around and went back up six days later and summited. Because the, the, first, the first time we went up, it was that year in 2012 that had the really mad queue. There was a really famous photo and there was a lot of people there. So, I mean, this is the thing with the queues. Everyone talks to each other. Like there's no surprise, all the teams, what day are you going for? Because the weather windows, people know the dates of the weather windows. So the summit can happen. So everyone knows what date they're going for. We intentionally went for the later date so there'd be fewer people and we were lucky because if we'd gone up the night before our camp three got taken out by an avalanche like all our tents got taken out the only thing that wasn't taken out was our tent with the oxygen now if that had been taken out as well we wouldn't have gone up there and obviously if we'd been up there the next day we would have all been in the avalanche and what would have happened to us so that was quite lucky and then when we went up there oh you know what i think seven people died that night on the first summit maybe it was four I don't know, it was, it was mental. Like I remember I was on the South Pole and I think this is the last time I ever muttered something religious. And um, I was standing there and there was these two Sherpas, they'd just come down from the summit and they just had ice. You know, they were just covered in ice all over them. And I remember looking at my mate and I went, oh, you know what, I goes, I'm not religious. I goes, but God protect us tonight. Huh? Mm. And my mate went, yeah, I'll take that. And literally it was, because our summit day, there was a storm due to coming by 10.30 in the morning, but you should be summiting at, you leave at say eight, nine o'clock at night. You should be on the summit about five in the morning. You should be down at South Cole by 10. 
you know, maybe even pushing to camp three. But this storm come in like 12 hours early. And because there were so many people waiting for the summit, they all got caught up there. And then what happens is they just wait. And when you run out of oxygen, those high altitude illnesses, they start to come on very quickly. So, and this is the thing, a lot of people, they decide the summit is worth more than their life. You know, I mean, these, these people that die up high, it's a strange thing to talk about, but a lot of them, they kind of, it's hard to talk about because they've kind of put themselves in that position. Like the inexperienced people, they weren't up there on their own. You know, they had, a, they, most of them probably had a Sherpa next to them saying, you need to go down, mm. you know, but the problem is, it's an expensive job. I know someone who remortgaged their house and that was the year of the Sherpa strike. So they didn't even get on the mountain because the Sherpa strike happened. So that's a lot of money. If you're sponsored, that can be hours and hours on my telephone getting that sponsorship. The two months off work, that's not an easy thing to get, you know? So when you've got the cost, the time off work and everything, I think that's why people go all out and because they don't think oh, if the summit's bad, I'll just go up in a few more days. I don't know why they don't. Maybe they're not strong enough, I don't know. But the companies almost push it like you've got that one shot and that's it. You know, I don't see why. If the shot fails, hey, go down, risk, try again. Mm. I, I don't know why people don't push that. It's just an all or nothing. You've got one shot and that's it. You know, and I think maybe if people went there with a bit of a mentality of, because I'll be honest, like, I've been on about nine, 8,000 meter expeditions and only summited four. Like I actually go there expecting not to summit, you know, because there's a lot like, you know, people in the military, oh, you'll smash it, you'll do it. And it's like, it's not really like that. You know, the mountain decides if you're going to get up there or not, you know, and someone said, you don't conquer a mountain, you get up when it's not looking and hopefully you get back down before it even noticed you were there. And I, I really like that saying, you know, yeah. it, it allows you to summit. You don't summit, it let you. Because when the mountain shows its teeth, it's not good. So what kind of expedition were you on? Were you on one of these kind of gorilla things where you just grabbed a, partnered up with a Sherpa, paid, paid for your license and climbed? Or, or were you in a, an organized team? No, well, what, what I've done, you've got, you've got many levels. So you've got the high roller companies that are charging, well, they're charging maybe 70,000, something like this. And you get a lot with that. And one thing you get, you'll get a Western guide. So for three people, there'll be one guide with them. So if you've got a team of 12, you'll have four Western guides taking them all up. And that's fine. If you, that's a good level of safety, you know, that's very good. But there's a lot of people now, you can just go, maybe, and you can have a Sherpa with you. But the Sherpa, you won't actually see until summit day, you know, because you don't actually need to be moving with a Sherpa lower down on the mountain. Like you really don't, like they sort of move tents and stuff up the hill and then you can do what you want. I mean, I've, I've most times I've moved through the ice floor, I've been on my own. You know, it's only on that summit day because it's on the summit day where the trouble happens. You know, if, if ever there's fatalities, it's more likely to be up there. If outside of that, it will probably be avalanches or something that happens in the Kumbu Icefall. Mm. You know, but it's that summit day where all the trouble, that's when everyone's sort of nervous because, you know, as I say, things go wrong. Above 8,000 meters, you really feel like you're stepping into another game. Like summit days are really, because 12 hours, that's, that's, a, that's a short day. You know, I've done a climb once, I'll climb for like 25 hours. You know, and that was having done 12 hours the day before, 14 hours the day. You know what I mean? It's big, 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 long, long, lots of time, you know, and you've got to be fit for it and then you can get away with it. I mean, my friend said the best training for Everest is go to somewhere like Wales, get as drunk as you can, then the next day put weight on and go over the hills for 10 hours. And that will give you some idea of how bad you'll feel. You know, because you, you just don't feel good up there. You just feel crap. And you're going to do the most physically demanding thing of your life in a physically depleted state from the get-go. Yeah. 
because, you know, just being up at altitude, we, we're not evolved to, to be above four, four and a half thousand meters long term. You know, so when you're at five, four, whatever the base camp is, you're just degrading and degrading and degrading. You're not getting stronger for being there. You're just acclimatizing. You know, like your you red blood cell response, that's adapting, but your muscle tone's going down. You know, you're losing weight. So on one side, you're adapting, and on the other side, you're, you're just degrading, you know? Gosh. And so going yeah. back to the team, team thing, how many were you with? There was, I think there was 12, 12 of us, all from different parts. There was Dutch, there was two Canadian, uh, there was an Australian, um, oh, God, multinational team. Bad luck. Yeah, and that's really good, you know, like you, you get, and because we went with a bit of a cheaper company as well, people aren't so, they're, they're okay. I mean, I was on a mountain once and you've got like the CEO of Under Armour, you know, on one of the teams. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think he's a nice bloke, but I don't think I'd want to be on a team where you've got people like that around you. Mm. You know, that's a little bit too, I don't know. I'd rather have someone a bit more closer to me that I can get on with, you know? Yeah, of course. But. And I asked uh, Nims this. Mm. So Nims Die, for anyone, if, if you, for friends watching, if you haven't watched my podcast with Nims Die, who summited the world's 14 highest mountains in six months, knocking seven and a half years off the record, so he's a Gurkha that joined the SBS, which is fascinating in itself. Please go and watch that podcast because, um, yeah, you can you can get a lot from Nim's story. Yeah. But I sort of, I've got this bit of a fantasy, Richie. Yeah. Because a lot of things I do, I just go and do them. And yeah. I cut through all the planning and I cut through the worrying and the stress and the this and the training and, and I just, just go and do it. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that's always the best way. Yeah. And I'm not naive. I've read every book I can on Everest. I've watched every documentary. I've watched all the National Geographic stuff, right? I, 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 I would expect to see dead bodies litter in the mountain. It wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't, you see some of these climbers, they see a dead body and they piss their pants and you think, what did you expect to see at the top of Everest? It's a very dangerous place, right? But alongside yeah, that, there as well. say again, mate. There's a lot up there as well. Yeah. You don't see them in the park, but when you come down in the day, you start, oh, 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 they're all over the place. Yeah. But, but putting that to one side, there's always, you know, the, there's a part of me that, I wonder how you'd fare if it was your absolute dream to summit Everest and you just literally rocked up there. I don't know how you get the permit, but obviously you got your permit. I'm guessing yeah. some people don't even get that. Um, and could you just partner up with a Sherpa? Could you haul your own kit? Do people, for example, use other people's tents and just think well look there's going to be loads of tents up there we'll just crash in one to save us carrying how does it all work right yeah well that now we've got a thing that happens on the mountain called slip streaming now when you go to a mountain you can go base camp only which is you've got base camp but then on the mountain you're doing your own thing and that's how people climb big mountains for a lot cheaper they don't move with a sherpa or anything they're on their own but they do what you do, what you said. They find tents. There's stories of people getting in and just with their crampons still on, just getting into sleeping bags. And, you know, because people are so tired, they just don't care. You know, so, I mean, we've, we've had situations where we've got to a camp, we've got in our tent and there's someone in there. Mm. You know, like we've had situations, like when I was climbing Lotsey in 2016, um, I was waiting to sort of uh, go up and someone tried to come in my tent and I said, no, you can't come in my tent. Anyway, no one let him in. 
And I thought, and I could hear him outside. And I thought, right, I'm not going to sit here and listen to this bloke die. And I went, and I knew what he was doing. I knew he was slipstreaming. You know, so I said, right, mate. I goes, I'm not going to go to the summit tonight. I goes, I'm going to save your life. I went, get in the tent and shut the fuck up. You know, I was really, really pissed off with him. Anyway, I didn't go to the summit that night. I kicked him out. And then he wasn't even climbing Lotsey. He got out the tent and then started walking down the hill to go to the North Cole so he could climb Everest. Because when you climb Lotsey, Camp 4 is on the way to the South Cole for Everest Camp 4. They're out on the same mountain, you know. So the route is 85% the same. It's just above the yellow band. You do a slight movement if you go into Lotsey Peak. So this bloke had come up. I'd blown out my summit attempt to let him come in. And basically all that had happened, he got too tired, couldn't make it to the South Cole, and thought he'd try his luck with Lotsey Camp before and try and find an empty tent. So that's what happened. And then I kicked him out. I managed to summit still. But I mean, these, these are the sort of things that happen, you know. I mean, I mean, there'll be other none of the other people let him in their tent. Mm. You know, but I was literally, I could hear him outside. You know, and it's like, I can't sort of ignore this and get out and he's sitting there frozen to death the next day, knowing I could have done something. Yeah, of course. You know, it's uh, so that that kind of thing, the slipstreaming, that's that's a naughty thing, that is. You know, I mean, you can do it and you can get away with it, you know, but it's it's dodgy. If, you, if you're if you coming down and you're knackered and there's no tent and you ain't got the strength to go down lower, you've got a real problem. You know, and then that's the thing. The more money you pay, you get a good level of safety with that. So when you pay 70 grand, you've got that that Western guy, you've got that Sherpa. Some people have two Sherpas with them, you know. But when you cut corners and you slipstream and you go cheaper, you're sacrificing safety. Now, if you're a professional climber, yeah, you can do that. But if you're just, just trying to cut corners, it's, it is, it's a messy game. It yeah. really is. So... Another question then, and I'm just putting this out there, folks. I'm not suggesting that this is a possibility, but take a guy like myself, right? That I've obviously been in the outdoors a reasonable amount. I've, I've, I've been up mountains, but I haven't, I wouldn't class myself as a mountaineer or, or even a climber. I've only ever like done it for fun. Yeah. What, what's to stop me rocking up at Everest base camp with my team whatever you yeah. know it what 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 are the skills that that i'm needing to learn i mean obviously i can get a cooker on obviously i can put a tent out or get into a sleeping bag obviously i know about frostbite obviously i know about you know managing your core temperature i'm guessing it, it yeah, you know, it doesn't look that difficult to clip onto a rope. Yeah. Um, crampons, I think, you know, you probably could look at them for five minutes and work out how these things need to be yeah. put yeah. on. If I'm going to fall down the slope, I'm going to fall on my ice axe, right, and stop myself sliding. Um, and then, of course, you know, I, I feel like I'm aware enough to recognise mountain sickness in other people's. So... Other than that, Richie, what, 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 what's, what's the learning process? Why is it you need to do four months training before you go? I'll be honest, the, the one thing that you can't get, and another, another Marine mate asked me the same thing. You can turn up, yeah, and you can maybe sum it, you know, and people do. But the thing is, what you won't know is how you, on an individual level, how your body behaves at altitude. Because you could be the fittest guy in the world, but you just may be crap at altitude. Mm. You know, like, I mean, I know a guy, and he's like a 245 marathon guy. He weren't that strong in the mountains, though. You, you know, it's really, that's, that's the thing with it. How, how are you up high? You can be the fittest guy in the world, but for some reason, your body just isn't that good at triggering that red blood cell response for you. You know, but, this is why you do those other climbs. I mean, what they're trying to do in Nepal now is say at least climb another 8,000er or a 6,000er or a 7,000er. But yeah, as I say, I mean, yeah, you, you, you probably could pull up and get away with it. You know, if the weather's on side, you know, you get some good windows, there's no problems, you acclimatize well. 
yeah, it, it could all happen. But it's like the thing mountaineering is like swimming the Atlantic, if uh, rowing the Atlantic, if the weather gods are on your side, anything's possible. But when Mother Nature decides to have a hissy fit, that's when you need skills, knowledge, experience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. You know, but I say, I think the main thing with the training is, it's that altitude thing. It's just knowing what you're like at altitude, you know. How do you manage the sweating? Because you've got these bloody big, big eider down suits on, which I, I guess are brilliant when you're sat on the peak and it's bitterly cold. There's a 30 mile an hour, 30 mile an hour wind sapping all the heat from your body. Great. Yeah. You got to, you got to climb up there in this suit. Are you not getting soaking wet and then freezing the moment you stop? Nah, they're, um, you're not, you don't, I am the world's most sweatiest person and I've never had a problem with them because when you're up at that height, it's so cold. You're just not, you're just not that hot and you can't move fast enough to generate that kind of heat either. Cause what you're doing is, is you're on that summit day. You've just got to keep evaluating. It's your hands and your feet. You know, and what a lot of people, so what I do, I sort of step and I step and I'm thinking if my feet get cold, I start crunching my toes. And then about 20 minutes later, my toes will probably be warm again. You know, but if you just ignore it and forget about it and you've got 12 hours, then by the time you get your boots off, you've got 12 hours of frozen toes you ain't been thinking about. Mm. You know, and that's what people do. They're not thinking, why my toes are cold. Why are they cold? What can I do about that? You know, like you're moving up the rope. This hand might be getting cold because it's above the heart. So step over the rope, use your left hand and start getting some feeling back into this. You know, don't just ignore it. Be aware of yourself, what you're doing, how you're feeling, how are you moving, mm. you know, and, you know, little by little, you chip away. I'm guessing now that they have ele electric boot warmers and hand warmers, don't they? Yeah, some people use them. I've I've never used anything like that personally, mm. you know, but they're there, you know, I mean, compared to what they used to have, I mean, <laughs> apparently like the stuff they used to have was actually quite effective. It just weighed a ton because you, you was wearing like millions of layers of cotton clothes and stuff. Mm. But uh, what's yeah. it like? What's it? What's it like eating then and cooking? Do, do you have much of an appetite? It, are you using like a an MSR multi fuel stove or? Yeah, yeah. You've just got um, you got Epi gas is what we use, and you've just got your stove. I mean, one thing you can do is just put like hang the stove, and then you can put a candle underneath the gas. Mm. So if the flame's a little bit low, just that little bit of heat on the gas can just get the flame going a bit better. Uh, I mean, the cooking's fine, to be honest, it's just a pain in the ass getting the snow because, you know, you've got a bag like that and it gives you like that much water. You know, it's uh, you need so much snow. And I mean, the appetite sometimes, like they say, if you was to eat like a 300 calorie meal, you probably you won't get much from it because your body would use more energy to digest that from when you get from it. Because when you're above six, seven thousand meters, that's that's not our evolution, mm. you know? So all our digestion, I mean, above 8,000 meters, they call it the death zone because you are actually starting to die. So when you're above 7,000 or close to it, at like camp three, you're already, your physiology is already behaving differently, mm. you know? And as I say, it's like, it's like doing a marathon back to back, day after day, week after week, for two months or something, you know? But I mean, but then there's other people and they eat and they're fine and they fly up the mountain and it's quite subjective. But once again, the more you do it, the more you get used to it. Like, I think the first time I went to base camp, I was like, oh, my God, this is so high. Now I go to base camp and it's like, right now the work begins, you know, getting to base camp. That, that's the non plus bit. That's like that shouldn't be a problem. That's, you know, you shouldn't be struggling getting to any base camp if you're there to climb an 8000 meter peak. And that, you know, that, that really is the long and short of that, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, and what's the actual. As I say, yeah. What's the actual climb like then, Richie? Because I've, um, again, I'm not trying to compare myself to a, a mountain climbing, not in any way, shape or form. But yeah. I've had things where 
um, I was in South America. I went for a run one day. Um, was I in Aguas Caliente? I think that's what the place is called. It's basically the last village you that's, get. That's your picture. Yeah, it's the last village you get Aguas to. Aguas Caliente at the bottom. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've been there. So I was there, staying there. I was, I was in a backpacker. I thought, right, I'm going to go for a run. So I went out with my trainers on, and I, I saw this little hill going up. I thought, oh, challenge myself here. I'll run up this hill. And it basically carved up the side of what I thought was a valley. And it went up and up. And I just kept running, which is weird, because in the, when I was in the Marines, I found running really hard. Going uphill was just like I felt like death. And yet this run, this run, I'm just, I'm running up and I'm running up and I didn't stop. Finally got to a ladder that was, um, uh, it'd been like hammered into the rock face, a sheer rock face. So I climbed up this huge ladder, got out on, on, on some more rocks, kind of a bit like the old Tarzan films, the, the precipices you used to see in the Tarzan films. So I just kept running and I ran and finally I came out on top of this peak and right above me was the huge Inca flag, so the rainbow flag. And I turned around, I was looking down on Machu Picchu. Oh, I was you, you run up Winu Picchu. I was across the river. I don't know what I was on. Oh, okay. But, but when I turned around, there was that legendary sight of Machu Picchu down yeah. below me right it was one of the greatest one of my greatest moments traveling was to I hadn't paid any money hadn't paid a tour guide to, I hadn't paid the 30 bucks to get into Machu none of that I'd done it accidentally ended up on top of this mountain looking down at, and then when I when I ran the length of the UK and I'm carrying, you know, I'm carrying a hefty backpack. When I got to hills, and I was tempted to start walking, it just became easier just to keep running. So I just keep running, and I, one hill in Wales, I think it was 18 kilometres straight up, and I just ran, I ran the whole way. It was just easier to, and more time economic to keep running, right? Mm. So when I think of Everest. I think wouldn't it be nice to get on the mountain and realize actually that you you know your your body was quite good at this like nims was saying nims was just a natural at it he could run almost yeah. run up run up these mountains um so go into your experience how did you find did you ever have days where you were just like rocketing up or is it always hard work I think, I mean, the higher you go, the harder it gets. I mean, with it, so, I mean, your first acclimatization, it could take you maybe five hours to get through the ice fall. And then once you're acclimatized, you only take you three hours, mm. you know, but then you're still moving fast relevant to how you're feeling, you know? So I guess for me, it's like, if it takes five hours and I'm feeling crap, or if it takes three hours and I'm feeling crap, you're always moving at whatever is your ability to move at. And the thing with the ice fall is you're trying to race the sun because obviously you try and go through in the middle of the night when it's frozen solid, you know, because the ice fall moves by like two meters a day or something. That's why the ice doctors have to go through in the morning and make sure the ladders are still there and all that. And as you're climbing up, you can see like the, the sun is coming up the bottom of the ice pool. And you know that once that sun's on the ice, it's going to get heat, it's going to get hot, and it's going to expand very quickly. And maybe things will start moving near you that you don't want moving near you. Like you go, past, there's some like ice pinnacles and they're like, it's like four cars on top of each other. And it's like, if that falls on you, you know, that ain't going to be good. And I remember once I was going down and some Sherpas, they don't like it if you, if you go past them. You know, especially if you're a Westerner. And not that I do that, don't get it wrong, but he, this Sherpa was moving with his client, whoever that was. And I was trying to get down fast because there was all these big things around me. The sun was on us. And I'm like, excuse me. He's like, are you in a rush? Are you in a rush? 
and I looked and I pointed at this big thing, like this big ice thing looming. I went, yeah, and pointed at that. And he went, yeah, okay. You know, I think once he realized why I was trying to move fast rather than he probably thought I was just, I don't know what, but it was a safety thing, not a, oh, I'm really fast. Look at me thing, because that's not me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in fact, what, just one second. Yeah, Richie, talk us through your summit day then. Right. Well, so the, the first summit day, because we had to go up twice. So the first, because the, the actual summit day, the weather was so good, there's not really that much to say about it, you know. We just come from the, come out of the South Coal, you know, you get up to the balcony and, uh, you know, you, you get up to the balcony and you sort of like, you cut a left getting up to the South Summit. And this is the first bit where the mountain starts to go like that. Because, you know, all lower down the mountain, it, it's literally like a massive field on its side. You know, you just, you're just too close to it to see anything. But as you come from the balcony and you go left, it starts becoming a lot more conical. You know, and you start to really feel like yeah, I'm, I'm starting to get there. You, you can actually start to let yourself believe this is going to happen. You know, because you've really got to kind of keep that in check. You know, is this going to happen? Ain't it going to happen? And sort of as you're getting to that self summit and then you can see that summit just across the way. You know, you're like and you look at the watch and, you know, everything It's like not five o'clock yet. And you're like, you can see it. You're like less than an hour from the summit. And you're like, this is actually going to happen this is really going to happen you know and then you know you sort of you had got the hillary step which isn't there anymore because apparently the rock fell away after the earthquake in mm -hmm. 2015 and then you get over the hillary step and that wasn't there wasn't a crowd there or anything like that there wasn't that many people on the summit when i got there and then you just get on that last field you know and as you go up you know what it's the thing is there's still so much work to do before you're down and you're safe so I, you, I didn't really get there and think, yeah, I've made it. I kind of got there and thought, don't drop your guard. You've still got to get down, you know, and, and you can't see this, the curvature of the earth from the top of Everest. You're not high enough. And I know people that say that they can and they're public speakers and they just say, Richie, it sounds good. You know, and, they know you can't see it. You can't see, you can't see it from a plane. You can't see it from every. It's a nice thought. You know, and maybe if you've got a picture on a GoPro because that distorts it, it can show there's a curvature. But unfortunately, I wish you could see it from there, but you just can't. You know, but then, but then you get up there, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was, you know, compared to six days before when we tried to summit and there was the deaths and the storm and blah, blah, blah. Everything that went wrong six days before went right on this one. You know, and then... Uh, I remember one of the guys was up there and he actually didn't have a camera and I just took my gloves off to take a camera. My hands were in agony. Like I think I took my gloves off for like a minute, took the photo, put the gloves back on. And then uh, this guy, Steve, he's an Aussie and he's like, Oh, Rich, can you take my picture? And I thought, and I'm like, not really. I goes, my, my hands are killing me. I goes, give us a minute. And I goes, can, can you ask like, your Sherpa that's with you. I'm thinking he's, he's got a camera. And then he stood there and went, great, I'm on the summit of Everest and I can't get a picture. I didn't realise he didn't have a camera. You know, I thought he wanted me. So I'm like, all right, I took my gloves off, took the quick picture, put the gloves back on. But uh, what an idiot. <laughs> Goes up there without his camera. You well, know? everyone must really plan for that. So if they got their mo, I bet they got their mobile, they've got it, you know, close to their skin to keep the battery warm. It's yeah. the, it must be the everyone wants that photo, don't they? Or video. Well, that's, I mean, when I climbed Lotsey, because I was on my own at the top, I was using my phone because a lot of Apple phones, they don't like the altitude either. So my phone was working at about 7,800 meters. But when I got onto the summit of Lotsey at 86, it, it wasn't working. And I was there on my own. I couldn't take a summit picture. But hey, I know I did it and I don't care what anyone says. That's my my fault on not having that photo. 
So, so yeah, for every year you got to. So you see these massive queues. Nims Die took one of those iconic pictures of the huge queue. Yeah. What, why don't people just, I mean, I'm sure some do. Why don't they just get up earlier, go earlier, even if it's darkness when they summit? They do, but it's kind of like people will be leaving between sort of eight at night to midnight. So people will be gradually trickling out, trickling out of South Cole for about four hours or three hours. And then on average, they're looking at maybe eight or nine hours to the summit from South Cole. Maybe something like that, mm -hmm. you know, and then as they get there, they just all start to bottleneck up. You know, it's it's just impossible. I mean, you've got that many people going. You, it's inevitable. It's just going to end. Mm. You know, and then the thing is, people, you could go earlier. I mean, my mate, his summit picture, he might as well be in a dark room. You know, it's like, I know he's on Everest because I was there when he did it. But his photo, he might as well be in the toilet with the light off, wearing a down suit and took a selfie. You know what I mean? So it's like. It'd be nice to get up there and see a bit of daylight as well, you know. Yeah, and everyone wants I, that. And I think that's another thing. Why are you going to get that build up, you know? Yes, I would. It's, it's and you're getting so many people. I would take the getting up there over the over the scenery, the the panorama, simply because the torture of of being stuck in that queue just to get up there in daylight must. The, the fact that you're stood there thinking, do you yeah. know what? If the weather turns now, we're all dead, you know, or, or a good number of these That's people, it. they're just going to die. They're all going to start panicking or they're going to lapse into hypothermia. Um, I think I'd rather yeah. just be a lone agent nipping up there quickly or as quick as you can. And if it's a bit dark, it, it yes. Yeah. Um, Get your photo another I mean, you day, can, go, you go to another 8,000. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing as well, because when you're on base camp, you know, everyone's done their acclimatizations and you'll know what the weather windows are. So say it's 17, 18, 19, most people will probably be going for 17 because that's the start of the window, you know. So most people go 17, 18, say, with the fewest going for 19. So my mentality, I'd be more likely to go for 19 because then that could get everyone out the way, you know. And it also depends when they are, though, because if you might have only one window and it might come on the 28th and the 29th. And if that's your only window, with the best will in the world, you're not going to review queuing in a situation like that. But then you might get a year where you might get the summit on maybe 12, 13, and then you might get another opportunity around 20, 21 uh, and then you might get another opportunity it very much depends on the year you know because it's you know you've got the jet stream and that and the jet stream has to raise to expose that that summit for you to get on it you know because when it's just constantly in the jet stream and you see that sort of like that dust go in the jet stream rises which gets you on it and that's only a handful of times it happens as because as the monsoon comes in the monsoon comes in off the ocean hits the himalaya goes up and it kind of raises the jet stream or something like that, as well as creating snow. But, and this happens between summer on the monsoon coming and then autumn or the monsoon leaving in autumn. It only happens between those two changes of season, which is why you've always got the spring season and the autumn season for the 8,000ers. Got you. But Everest is always classically done in the spring season. It could be climbed in the autumn season autumn season probably colder but you can still get that those exposed ridges mm. and you climb from the nepalese side is that right i've actually been on both sides i uh i climbed it for, I, I summited from the nepalese side and in 2018 when i was on the searching for irving we only went up to about eight five eight six i think we didn't summit that was where our search area was so Around they there. they found so, Mallory. Sorry, they they found Mallory in that uh, National Geographic documentary, didn't they? Or the documentary. Right. Are you saying yeah, that? You, right, yeah. you, are you saying you had a separate 
expedition to find Ir Irving. That's Irvine. right, yeah. Yeah. So we had that in uh, two, 2018. Mm. We were... Um, we were looking, I mean, we had, because we had the maps with all the search areas and we know there's, there's like a fall line. So there's like an area where they've found an ice axe, like an, an ice axe head. And then they've found like a few other things. And then you've got the ice axe head and then you've got where Mallory was found. So they think there's like a fall line down the mountain. And we think Irving's in there somewhere. But like when they found Mallory, it was a very low snow year. You can look at the documentary and you see a lot of rock, you know, because there wasn't so much snow. But when we were there, the mountain was just covered. You know, there was just, there was only two of us. So it was Did really... They, they covered Mallory back up, didn't they, with rocks on? Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I mean, what our plan would have been, I mean, we was discussing it. And to be honest, if we found him, that would have just been the start of our problems because you're not actually allowed to search for a body on the south, on the north side, because the Chinese don't want that. And my friend runs company, runs trips there every year. So it's like, this would affect his business, you know? And then we were like, I said, well, I think the moment we find him, we've got to ring, ring the granddaughter and get her involved because she might not want us touching her really. You know, and then that would have its own problems. And then we were like, well, let's say we find him and we find the camera, because potentially if we found him, we had the camera that showed Mallory had summited in 1924. I mean, that's what you're talking about here. This, I think this was my potential break if it had gone, but it wasn't to be. But because we had a team on the south side as well, we was discussing maybe if we got the camera, we could go to the summit, hand it over to the guys on the south side, they could take the camera down, but because they're the Sherpa and that, will they understand how important it is to keep that camera cold? You know, can we trust that? And then we were thinking basically what we thought we'd do if we found him, we'd just mark him and get the Chinese government involved. And if, and if they freeze us out, so be it. You, you know, I think when you're talking about that, you know, you're in China, you're searching for a body, you're on every, you're not supposed to be doing that. If you find him, I think you've got no choice but to get them involved, you know, and maybe they might say, no, stay out. We're going to find him and claim the glory. And that's fine. But that's the risk we, have, we were willing to take if we'd found him, you know. Yeah. Because. Uh, Richie, yeah, to, that would just. Just to finish off. So what's it like then, that monumental moment where you are, let's say, five steps from the summit of Everest and, and your dream is, you know that your dream has come true. Do you know, it's actually a bit of an anti-climax. You know, it's, it's a, because as I say, when you get up there, you, you can't let your guard down. You just can't, you know? And it's like, I got on the summit, I wasn't back to base camp for two days. So it's only when you get to base camp, you can kind of think I've done it because the most dangerous bit's the ice fall. And that's the lowest point on the mountain. And that's where most people have died historically. Wow. So you're like, I'm on the summit, but I've still got to go through that ice fall. You know, so, I mean, to be honest, I was so dehydrated. I think I, think I might have even tried to shed a tear, but I was so dehydrated, nothing come out. Because the, the oxygen as well, the oxygen really, really dehydrates you, mm. like badly. Okay. I couldn't even swallow because it hurt. You know, it's that's one of the things uh, that comes with that. But I also I took like a small vial of my dad's ashes with me, like, uh, and I just sort of like just from the top, just sort of scattered them out. You know, I didn't I didn't say anything. I asked my friend about it, and he said, "Don't say anything to the Sherpas because maybe." No, no, no. You, you know what I mean? They could be a bit superstitious or something. It's like, all right, you know, I mean, I did it very low profile. I don't think anyone would have noticed what I was doing, you know, but for me, that was quite a nice little touch, just scattering some of my dad's ashes from the summit. Wow. You know, that, that, that was the real moment more than the actual standing there, you know. What, uh, what, what, one final question from, a, again, from a technical point of view, what, what are you drinking on the way up? you know and why doesn't it freeze 
Yeah, right. So, I mean, you, you know, like Tang, Tang juice or LucasAid sachets or things like that. You know, you can be used that just to get the extra calories in there. Or it, it might just be water, you know. And then when you put your ball of water, say it's boiling hot, and then it sits inside your down suit. I mean, my friend had had it where it's so cold that the water's kind of frozen on the outside bit of the bottle, but the inside bit next to his body is okay. Because mm. I think if it, if it gets that cold and it's going to freeze inside your down suit, then you've got bigger problems than dehydration, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, so, listen, so you can, you can it. this has been an awesome chat. Thank you ever so much. I've thoroughly no, enjoyed you, it. Mate. Maybe we'll uh, reconvene at some point and go for part two. What? What? What's I, might, um, I think I might be taking a team to Everest in spring. In spring, actually, because my mate, he's. He's on Everest, but there's like a Bahrain team. So he comes on the Seven Summits Trek, who were helping NIMS as well. So Seven Summits Trek is like the biggest Nepali company hmm. over there. So we sort of come with them and sort of I was doing some work for them in 2016. So I think I'll have that team in April, May yeah, on Everest. But I don't have to summit. I just have to go to camp too. You know, and then sort of be on the radio when all the summit pushes are happening and all things like that and just the logistics and stuff. So that's wow. what's next for me. So if you want to go there, you should get in touch. I can get good rates. Yeah, let's... But let's, then NIMS will throw you away anyway. And we can we can introduce you to the drinking base camp scene. <laughs> Spent my whole life, mate, 30 years trying not to drink. <laughs> yeah, fair one. I drink more in the mountains than what I do when I'm at home, actually. Mm. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I bet. I bet. That's a whole nother subject again. Yeah. Richie, stay on the line so I can thank you properly. But but on behalf of the podcast, thanks ever so much, mate. Brilliant. Thank you. To everybody at home, big love to you all. If you could like and subscribe and, and share the video, that would be great. And uh, let's chat soon. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.